what I'd like to do in the time that I have is to basically summarize some work that we and others around the world have been involved with over the last two decades at least to try to answer the question, how and when does asthma begin? And our group has really focused on the role of uh, the common cold virus, uh, rhinovirus, um, but I'm gonna be bringing in some other data too that involves not only viruses, but bacterial species. So how did we all get interested in this? Well, in probably the late 1990s, there were data to suggest that there were both genetic and environmental factors that were very important in terms of the development of allergic sensitization, which then um, after that was set into place, infants would begin to wheeze with lower respiratory infections. And it appeared as if these genetic components and these environmental factors, including factors within the microbiome, had to interact at a critical time period in the development of the newborn and the infant in order for uh, recurrent uh, wheezing to develop and ultimately the expression of the asthmatic phenotype. So our group began a prospective study, which has been funded by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, again in the 19, late 1990s, called COAST. It's an acronym which stands for Childhood Origins of Asthma. And we designed it to be a prospective study in a high-risk cohort designed to evaluate the interactions among age, patterns of immune dysfunction, and virus and bacterial infections with respect to the subsequent development of asthma and allergic diseases. Now at the outset, I'd like to recognize many of my colleagues who have contributed to the data that I'm gonna show you and many of the students and fellows um, and others that have helped on this project. And of course, I wanna recognize the families and the children who participated um, in, in the COAST project. Well, let's discuss first asthma inception. The way we designed COAST was to do a longitudinal evaluation of 289 newborns from Madison, where I live, and the Dane County area. And again, this is a high-risk cohort in which at least one parent has to have allergies and or asthma. We began following them collecting cord blood at birth, and we performed nasal washes that were collected during well child visits, but also during times of respiratory tract illnesses. This then allowed us to look at the timing, the severity, and the etiology of respiratory illnesses throughout um, childhood. And we picked a few time points to look at endpoints. We did a longitudinal evaluation of the development of allergic sensitization. And in doing so, and collecting all these different respiratory tract specimens and looking at a lot of immune parameters, we were able to diagnose persistent a wheezing at the age of three years. One other major outcome for us with 90% retention of the original cohort was to make a diagnosis of pediatric asthma when the kids were six years of age. So we've, the cohort obviously now is over 20 years old and we continue to have participation by now the um, young, uh, young people, young men and young uh, women. Um, and what I'm gonna show you is data in terms of longitudinally what happened from birth now out to 15 to 20 years. Now, the first major observation we made was by my colleague, Dan Jackson, who looked at the importance of rhinovirus wheezing illnesses versus RSV wheezing illnesses in the first three years of life 
and the subsequent development of asthma when the kids were six. So what we're graphing here is asthma at six years along the y-axis, and then looking at four different groups. First, those that did not wheeze in the first three years with either virus, those that wheezed with RSV only. And you can see, as was reported in the literature um, previously, that this significantly increased the risk of the kids going on to developing asthma. But was really surprising to us in an original observation that wheezing with rhinovirus during these first three years greatly enhanced the chances of these kids going on to getting asthma by the time they were six. And if they wheezed with both RV and RSV, the chances of them going on to getting asthma were really no different than if they wheezed with rhinovirus alone. We then looked at other uh, respiratory pathogens, including parainfluenza, influenza, coronavirus, metanumavirus, adenovirus, enterovirus, and looked at whether or not the kids were wheezing with these various pathogens in year one, the black bar, year two, the gray bar, and year three, the very light gray bar. In those kids who went on to get asthma at six years of age, and those kids who did not. And I think you can see from this graph that the overall respiratory burden with virus infections was much greater in the kids that went on to getting asthma. And importantly, if the kids wheezed with a rhinovirus, this seemed to be the greatest risk factor. And the number of wheezing illnesses continued to increase from year one to year two to year three and in contrast, in those kids that did not go on to get asthma, this pattern of wheezing with rhinovirus was significantly uh, reversed. Well, we then went on to ask, is there something different about the host that allows them to wheeze with rhinovirus? Many people get the common cold, but not all people wheeze with it. And many people get the common cold they may or may not wheeze with it, and that doesn't necessarily um, mean that they're gonna go on to get asthma. So we began to explore whether or not there was, was something different about certain types of human rhinovirus, or whether or not, uh, in addition, there were host factors which were important as well. Now, up until about five to 10 years ago, we knew that there were definitely two species of rhinovirus, rhinovirus A and rhinovirus B. And then within the last five to 10 years, it was discovered that there was a third species and that was labeled rhinovirus C. Now, importantly, we knew that both A and B species bound to cellular receptors called ICAM and low density lipoprotein receptors, but rhinovirus C didn't seem to bind to either one of these. So it was definitely something different and we wanted to learn more about it. Now, when we looked at our coast kids in terms of the probability of these different species inducing an MSI or a moderate to severe illness, we noticed that it was much more likely to occur if they were infected with A or C, but if they were infected with human rhinovirus B, the chances of getting sick or more sick with this particular species was much, much less. Now, a number of other groups have looked at human rhinovirus C with some very interesting observations. First, a prospective population-based surveillance study done in Nashville and Rochester involving over a thousand kids less than five years who were hospitalized with an acute respiratory illness or fever, what was found is, is that if their discharge diagnosis was asthma, they had a much greater chance of being infected with C than with A. Then a study out of Perth, Australia, they detected in an emergency department study, HRVC in 59% of children. And there was an increased severity of the illness in those who were infected with C versus those who were infected with A or B. 
Another important observation is when they followed these kids out longitudinally, if they were infected with C initially, they were much more likely to be readmitted at a later time point with a respiratory illness compared to all other respiratory pathogens. So there clearly was something different about getting infected with human rhinovirus C, which increased the risk for recurrence. Another important observation is that 53% of the children who are infected with C um, in these atopic children, being infected with C was associated with a six-fold increased risk of subsequent admission. So it appeared as if there was an interaction between this C virus and having allergic sensitization that in some way increased the risk um, for these kids to have um, future morbidity. Well, what about the receptor for C? One of my colleagues in Jim Gern's lab, Yuri Bochkov, began to explore whether or not um, he could identify what the receptor was for rhinovirus C. And what he found is, is that it was a unique, ex unique receptor. It was not expressed on undifferentiated epith epithelial cells in most cell lines, but it was expressed on fully differ differentiated epithelial cells. And then along came this particular paper from our colleagues in Denmark, in which they defined a, a looking at a genome-wide association study. They identified CDHR3 as a susceptibility locus for early childhood asthma in those kids who had severe exacerbations. So Yuri went on to determine that this CDHR3 um, protein was coded by a gene uh, that was a susceptibility gene. And this gene and this particular product mediated rhinovirus C binding and replication. We know that CDHR3 is a tr transmembrane protein with as, as yet unknown uh, function. And as I already told you, a coding SNP in CDHR3 previously linked to wheezing illness and hospitalizations for childhood asthma also mediated enhanced RVC binding and progeny yields in vitro. So a number of groups, including our own, are very interested in further defining the biology of this particular receptor with hopes of developing therapeutics which could block the binding of this virus to this particular receptor. Now, we also determined in our coast kids um, and in the Denmark COPSAC cohort that the CDHR3 asthma risk allele is associated specifically with our VC illness in early life in both of these cohorts. So this clinical evidence supports the earlier molecular evidence indicating that CDHR3 functions as a receptor for rhinovirus C. And I already mentioned to you that this has now um, allowed us to begin to explore whether targeting this particular receptor could potentially alter the severity of RVC infections. Well, what influence does allergic sensitization have on asthma risk? I've already presented to you some data from our colleagues in Australia to suggest that this combination of allergic sensitization and RVC illness really seems to be a, uh, a major uh, uh, risk factor for the ongoing development of asthma. So what we did again, and this is some work from my colleague Dan Jackson in the Blue Journal, looking at asthma risk at six years, and those kids who wheezed with rhinovirus in the first three years, and whether they were, had developed allergic sensitization 
by age three. Now this first bar are those kids who didn't wheeze with rhinovirus and did not have evidence of allergy at age three. This is the control group. Those kids who didn't wheeze with rhinovirus but did develop allergic sensitization to allergens, this alone increased the risk of the kids going on to getting asthma. If they wheezed with rhinovirus but weren't allergic, this increased the risk still further but if they both wheezed with rhinovirus in the first three years and developed allergic sensitization, their chance of going on to getting asthma was huge. So how does allergic sensitization alter the host response to virus infections? Well, this is some work done by uh, Sandy Durrani during his fellowship in Dan Jackson's laboratory. I'm sure many of you know that there are other cells besides mast cells and basophils that possess the high affinity IgE receptor, and they can be located in the peripheral blood. So what Sandy did is he isolated peripheral blood mononuclear cells, did some flow cytometry, looked at the expression of the high affinity IgE receptor on their surface, and then incubated these cells with human rhinovirus. And what he found is um, this then led to a uh, release of both type one and type three interferons, but the greater expression of this high affinity receptor on these cells was associated with decreased expression or release of these two interferons. They then went on and did another series of experiments where they actually took the cells again in, um, in, um, in vivo experiments. Now they crossed linked these FC epsilon receptors with an anti-IgE antibody. They incubated again with human rhinovirus and lo and behold, what they found is that um, this substantially further decreased the release of type one and type three interferons. So in an allergic host and who get rhinovirus infections, these interactions could potentially translate into more frequent and severe virus-induced wheezing illnesses, prolonged inflammation, and possibly airway remodeling and or loss of lung function. The next question I'd like to explore is what contributions do pathogens other than viruses contribute to asthma inception and exacerbation? And here I'd like to explore interactions between viruses and bacteria. And this is some work published um, quite a few years ago now by Hans Beskard in the New England Journal of Medicine in which they did nasal pharyngeal cultures in neonates within the first month of life and looked to see if they were colonized with strep, moroxella or H flu or a combination of these organisms and then followed them out to age five to see if there was any difference between those who were colonized and those that were not in terms of their going on to develop persistent wheezing. And interestingly enough, what they found is this early life colonization with bacterial species in the upper airway seemed to be associated with the increased risk of going on to develop persistent wheezing. Then another group, our colleagues from Australia um, who have a high risk birth cohort, very similar to coast, they looked at 234 of their kids. They did nasal um, secretion evaluation at two, six, and 12 months in 487 uh, kids when they were healthy and 534 when they were six, sick. <laughs> they looked at um, their microbiome, which was analyzed with 16S gene deep sequencing. They looked at both virology and RV typing, and they also looked at some clinical characteristics, including the presence or absence of uh, fever. 
And I know this is a busy slide, but what I'd like you to um, focus on is the three panels on the left are what they were able to culture at two, six, and 12 months of age when the kids were healthy. And then on the right, they um, different bacterial species that they were able to culture when they were, had an ongoing acute respiratory tract infection. And probably the most striking thing about this graphic is if you look at the first three bars with Haemophilus streptococcus and Moraxella, the height of the bars is much lower in healthy samples than it is during acute respiratory infections. And this is in direct contrast to what was seen in the lower three uh, bars when these kids were colonized with Allolococcus, Carnibacterium, and Staphylococcus, and as compared to when they were six. So clearly there's something about having these bacterial species that either um, leads then to a respiratory infection uh, with the virus um, or in some way sets up the environmental milieu in the airway to allow this infectious process to become much more significant clinically. The other thing they found that early colonization with strep was a risk factor for the future development of asthma. Febrile illness was also a, a risk factor and our old friend, if you will, HRVC, respiratory illnesses were also associated with future development of asthma. Now we've also looked at it in COAST um, and we looked, we've done the nasopharyngeal sampling and we analyzed these with the um, uh, collaboration with our Australian colleagues for both viruses and bacteria. And we developed developmental trajectories to determine if there was something different or predominant bacteria and, uh, for those kids who went on to get um, asthma at age six, eight, 11, 13, and 18 years of age. Now, lo and behold, what we found are these bad actors again, so to speak, Haemophilus, Strep, and um, another species of Haemophilus or two different species of um, Haemophilus and some of the other ones that were much more likely to be associated with health. Now, again, this is a busy slide, but I'd like you to focus on, um, this is looking at developmental patterns in the nasopharyngeal microbiome during infancy and which one of these can be potentially associated associated with future asthma risk. Now the key colors here are this light purple or orchid. It, it depicts those kids who had a predominance of staph at two months of age, still having staph present at four and at six months of age, and then looking out to uh, age uh, one, uh, I'm sorry, age three years. And what our statisticians were able to do based on the characteristics of how these species looked over time was develop four trajectories, A, B, C, and D. And the one I'm gonna focus on for your interest is trajectory C. Here, here we go with trajectory A, B, C, and D. And you can see here trajectory C in terms of the average number of wheezing illnesses per child in year one, two, and three, it was significantly greater with those that had this early colonization with um, staph. When we looked at the proportion that were diagnosed with asthma, again, trajectory C appears to be that uh, that is most highly associated with the development of asthma. And finally, in terms of the uh, development of allergic sensitization. What we're graphing here are the, the various trajectories and whether or not they had any positive aeroallergen test. And again, what we're showing here is that trajectory C seems to be associated with the highest risk of this particular phenotype. 
Well, finally, I'd like to look at gene by environment interactions and to focus on this 17Q21 uh, um, locus. And it's been known that variation at this part of particular locus, and I'm going to show you this, spanning five genes on chromosome 17Q12-21, and includes two genes, ORMDL3 and gastermin B, has yielded the most significant association in two asthma GWAS evaluations. And it should be noted that the 17Q12-21 locus is the most replicated asthma locus and represents the most significant genetic risk factor for childhood asthma known to date. Now, this is what this particular locus looks like on the top. Um, and the two genes that I'm going to focus on are this GSDMB and the ORMDL3 gene. And I'm going to come back to the significance of these black, gray, and white boxes in a few slides, because I think there's some very inform interesting information there that I would like to relate um, to you. Now, this is some work that we looked at in Coast and published in the New England Journal in um, 2013, looking at gene by pathogen interactions. This is one of the SNPs that is in this high risk uh, region. And um, what we found is when we looked at asthma prevalence in the cohort between ages six and eight, we looked at four different genotypes at this particular loci, homozygous CC, heterozygous CT, and homozygous TT. In those kids in blue that never wheezed with rhinovirus in the first three years, and the red bar are those kids who wheezed with human rhinovirus in the first three years. And I think you can see from this graphic that if you had one T allele, you, you have an increased risk of going on to getting asthma if you were infected with rhinovirus, and you were really at increased risk if you were homozygous. And importantly, if you didn't wheeze with rhinovirus, it didn't matter what genotype you had, your risk of going on to getting asthma was absolutely no different. Now, the importance of genetic studies is to be able to reproduce the findings. And these are the COST data that I just showed you. We replicated these in the COPSAC um, cohort, and we replicated them again in the pasture cohort. Now, interestingly, this, this particular genotype here is the risk allele or risk genotype. But when we look at some other aspect, including various environmental exposures, and this is looking at whether or not the kids were exposed to animals in barns during their first year of life. And now we can see that the risk of going on to getting, um, getting childhood asthma is significantly less for this genotype. So the findings are exactly opposite, which is really is a great example of a gene by environment interaction. So if we summarize the strongest genetic risk factor for childhood onset asthma um, is this 17Q12-21 locus, but the same risk genotype is protective against asthma among children exposed to barn animals in early life and the mechanisms for risk and protection are mediated through early life uh, wheezing illnesses. And again, the 17Q12-21 genotype effects on asthma risk are modified by environmental exposures during the first few years of life. And finally, a work in progress. This is again, this slide that I showed you previously. And importantly here, this is looking at the concept of linkage disequilibrium in the European American population and in an African American population. And the importance here is that these darker gray or black squares mean that it's almost impossible if you get a finding for uh, this particular uh, SNP, it's in linkage disequilibrium in such a high degree that 
distinguishing whether the effects you're observing are related to this SNP or this SNP is virtually impossible. In contrast, in the African-American population, you can see that the chances of this link linkage disequilibrium is much less in this high risk area. And so what Carol Ober, my genetic colleagues and her group did is we looked very carefully at these particular areas in both a European and an African American population. And what she found and her group found is that this GSDMB is in a family of genes that regulate pyroptosis or cell death with the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines in response to intracellular pathogens. And this GSDMB expression in airway epithelial cells and the SNPs that regulate ex its expression are now the leading 17Q12-21 asthma candidates. And therefore, this GSDMB is a potential therapeutic target for childhood onset asthma. So in conclusion, I hope I've given you a uh, summary of where things have gone in the last two decades in terms of genetic factors, as well as environmental factors, including viral respiratory infections, bacterial infections, I didn't have time to go into much of the microbiome, but I'm sure other speakers will. And the various allergists, the very important process of the development of allergic sensitization and its link with wheezing lower respiratory illnesses and the fact that these um, connections need, a, it appears to uh, interact at a critical developmental time point in order for the asthmatic phenotype to develop in early childhood. With that, I'm going to stop and I'd like to thank you for your attention.